welcome back to The Courage to Speak with me, Leonie Mellinger, the podcast that asks, what does it take to have the courage to speak up and speak out in life? My guest today is David Gower, a former English cricketer who is widely regarded as one of the most stylish and talented batsmen of his generation. David is known for his elegant and graceful playing style, which earned him a legion of fans around the world. His cricketing career spanned over a decade from 1978 to 1992, during which he played 117 test matches and 114 one-day internationals for England. He was the captain of the England cricket team from 1984 to 1986 and again in 1989, leading the team with flair and charisma. David Gower's contribution to English cricket is unparalleled, with a remarkable batting average of 44.25 in test matches and 39.49 in one-day internationals. Highlights include a Test Series win in India in 1984-85 and a successful Ashes win in 1985. In recent years, David has transitioned to a successful career as a cricket commentator and broadcaster, showcasing his wit, humour and insightful analysis. He continues to inspire others with his eloquence, making him a true icon in the world of cricket. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. For... Well, I guess it's all downhill from here, then. Isn't it? <laughs> One of the finest introductions ever. Well, as I mentioned in mm. my introduction, you are known for your eloquence as a speaker. Were you always, or was it different when you were a child? I think incredibly different. Really? I mean, this is, in fact, now you've asked the question. Yes. I'm almost completely flabbergasted at the the absolute difference, because. I mean, as a child, I was sort of beset by shyness. Really? Um, and found it very hard to initiate conversations. Or I'd respond to people. Yeah. And in, in many ways, sport itself did the talking. Um, and then when I, I mean, I've, I've sadly had to look back. I mean, it's, it's this dreadful thing called social media. People put things out there. And you go, well, that was me. Yeah. And I remember, I mean, I saw a thing quite recently, which was a, an interview I did when I was about 21. Yeah. Um, having already played a couple of games for England, things going well. So, you know, at the start of what turned out to be a relatively successful career. And it was just, I just looked, I thought, Christ, I mean, that was so shy, so um, you know, unresponsive. Yes. Um, and I just, I just well, yeah, things have changed. And then all those things that you get asked to do, for instance, when you are a, a budding county player. Yes. And you win an award, you know, a most promising player of the year or something. Which I remember, we used to have at Leicester, my first county, we used to have um, the end of season party at Labrick's Casino. Yes. Which had several benefits. One, the food was very good. Um, and of course, they gave you a you know, chance to play on the tables to earn their, the cost of the food back again. Yeah. Um, but we were impecunious cricketers on no money per, you know, per week at all. So we didn't have that much to spend with them. But they, I remember the, you know, the award being announced, David Gower is you know, our promising player of the year. And you're suddenly up there in front of your colleagues and one or two others trying to say thank you. Yes. And it was literally, uh, well, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, a bit tongue-tied, so that's it. Thank you. You know, it, it, it was Ooh. no more than that. And then the transformation comes, um, I suppose, quite logically with um, a growing in, you know, growth of confidence in yourself, um, greater awareness of the sort of things you should do, yeah. the sort of things you can say. Then you start borrowing other people's stories to make it more fun. Yeah. Then you adapt them to become your own story. Mm. Then you believe it's your story, and you know, it just—it's a, a sort of natural growth to all these things. And I think the—you know—the the key to it is confidence, and the key to it is realizing that um, it's not the end of the world if it goes slightly wrong, but actually it's better to say something than nothing. Yes, but it takes courage. And mm. so, in the beginning, at school, were you somebody who was one of the quieter people? Or you. Well, you, uh, it depends who you're with. Yeah. Like, like yes. everything in life, it kind of depends who you're with. Yeah. Um, and with your, with my friends at school who tended to be on the sporty side. Yes. You become as loquacious as anyone. You yeah. know, it's, the, it's the confidence of having exactly you know, knowing yeah. you can speak and not being derided or you know, nothing negative coming out of it. It's that, that confidence you get by being with equals. Yes. Um, and of course, when it comes to speaking later, you are. 
whether you're with equals or, you know, or strangers, it's just having the confidence to know that what you say is, is worth something um, and will work. So at school, I guess, you know, it depends, I say, it depends who's, mm. who you're speaking to, what the circumstances are. Um, sometimes you can be very, very quiet. Mm. Sometimes you can be a bit more garrulous. And it depends then whether you have any, sort of, any faith in what you've got to say. I mean, for instance, one of my great friends at school who just happened to be the headmaster's son, um, <laughs> very, very good man called Andrew Newell, yeah. who I see now and again. But I remember just one of those sort of little, little key moments. You remember so you're walking together from A to B mm. you know, through the, the lovely precincts of the Cathedral of Canterbury, which was mm. the base of our school, basically. And he's making the conversation. Mm. And because he's, you know, he's actually leading the conversation mm. because I'm following. Mm. And I, you give an answer, you respond. Yeah. But actually you then think, now what do I do? And you wait for the next question. So there's, again, that is a, tra- that's a sort oh. of a journey from being a passive participant right. in a conversation yeah. to actually being a, an originator. And you you, uh, you looked like a, a cherub with your blonde curls and you were in the choir, weren't you? I've seen pictures. Yeah, that was, well, true. Yeah. I can't deny it, um, <laughs> but not for long. Not for long. Okay. Not for long. I do, I mean, I love my music and I think, you know, I'm a yeah. huge fan of church music, actually. Yes. But there's a certain thing when you are a sort of 13-year-old at the new big school. Yes. And in fact, can I say this? You automatically got put in the choir because they needed to treble voices. Oh, right. So if your voice hadn't broken... Oh, I see. Yeah, it didn't matter whether you could sing or not. You <laughs> okay. hold a note or you knew the words or yeah. you know, the tunes to the hymns, which I did know, I guess, because yeah. I've been to a proper school before that, so we yeah. did a lot of hymn singing. But it didn't matter. You were in the choir automatically until your voice broke. Right. I remember one day within about a term going to see the music master going, Sir, sorry, sir, 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 <laughs> um, I think my, my voice is broken. I think my, my voice is broken. And he went ping on the piano. I went ping. And I went ping. <laughs> okay, you're out. Okay. <laughs> Although, having said that, Canterbury Kings was a... Fantastic music school. So those yes. that did know their music yes. had the most brilliant opportunities to progress it, whether you're playing the piano, the clarinet, whatever it might be, singing in the choir, enjoying yeah. the cathedral for what it is, and uh, contributing to the music there. But I'm also interested in the fact that you didn't exactly look like an obvious sportsman. So w- when you... Sorry. but oh, dang. <laughs> <when> you, <laughs> so... So, so when you well, first got into the, the, the professional world of, of cricket, w- mm. um, uh, did you feel a bit different or did, well, how did you fit in? <laughs> <laughs> okay. let's, let's just remember, <laughs> let's remember the dates. In 1975, yeah. or 74, 75, when I first went to Leicestershire, mm. um, the fashion for hair, yes. I mean, it did sort of brush one's shoulders. Yes. And so the, my... <laughs> I say this with huge embarrassment now. My, I mean, my last school photographs, the photographs of the first 11 and the first 15 and the rest of the hockey 11, they all had hair basically you know, almost at shoulder length yes. and wavy and blonde and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, so, yes, there was, um, I suppose, there were, you know, that's, that sort of faux angelic look. Yes. Um, underneath it all, there was you know, a devil sort of trying to come out. <laughs> um, would have confused people and would have been maybe... Yeah, but it wasn't at odds... With the fashion of the time. So, I mean, you know, the people I was then playing cricket with, uh, okay, some of them, like my captain at, at uh, Leicester, Ray Illingworth, was, you know, 20 odd years older than me and basically short back and sides. Right. So he wasn't, right. he wasn't embracing the shoulder length look. Right. But one or two of the, the similar aged colleagues were. So it wasn't as though I was the only one. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Luckily. Otherwise, yeah. I'd have probably had it cut in about three seconds. Right. Okay. Um, and of course, within time, and it didn't take too long, you are being encouraged to raise your standards of dress, yes. raise your standards of appearance to match those of a professional sportsman. Yes. Behave like a professional sportsman now and again. Yes. Um, and yes, so the hair came up a bit, and eventually, when you know fame and fortune struck, um, someone actually sent me a hairdresser who said, "What on earth are you doing with a parting? <laughs> you know, your hair, your head, your head does not need a parting." No. So you know, from that moment onwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've left it to do its pretty much its own thing. And did being really good at cricket help you in some way feel more confident about speaking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the um, whatever intellectual powers there might or might not have been, and the A-levels were all right, they weren't too bad. Um, mm. Whatever intellectual powers there were, mm. in a society like a 600-boy school, mm. sporting kudos gives you something yes. special. 
Yes. Um, and again, at King's, there were the sportsmen, there were the musicians, there were the academics. Mm. And I wouldn't call myself an academic, although the exams did get passed, mm. and you know, it's one or two, but actually rather good grades. Mm. Um, I, even, I even went to university for a moment or two. <laughs> um, but the, it was the sport that gave me the kudos. So actually, then you get a sort of certain, certain something from that. Is it because you can use the cricketing language to help you communicate? Um, later, yes. Yes. Later. But I mean, yes. at that stage, it's really whether a, it's, it's more a question of whether you've earned any sort of respect from your peers. Hmm. And, you know, boys' schools being what they are, you know, a lot of them would look up to the, the sportsmen. And by the time I'd finished, actually, it was a key moment in one's life. My last couple of terms there, we actually had what are they called girls, I think it's called. You know, they, we, you know, it was the first first few days of first time that uh, Kings had embraced the opposite sex. So going from an all boys school yes. to where it is now, which is pretty much fifty fifty mixed. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, obviously you know quite an interesting time to be a boy uh, at the peak of your physical uh, anyway development. Yes. Almost. Yes. Um, and then suddenly confronted with women. Which was actually it was obviously very dangerous, quite good fun. Yes. Um, an absolute learning curve. Yeah. Um, and, so how did you find communicating to to them? Well, it was it was fun. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it gives you again, it, like 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 everything else. Yes. You have to go from tongue tied. Yes. To maybe actually saying something. Yes. To maybe then actually working out what to say. Yeah. You know, it's it's a, it's yes. a progression that we all have to go through. Yeah, it depends yeah. what stage of our lives, whether it's in the mid-teens or mid-twenties or when you're about 60. Yeah. You finally learn to speak to someone. And what about communicating with your teammates? Um, How is that? Yeah, again, when you, well, when you, I mean, we're still talking about sort of the late teens. Mm. So going into a, an established professional cricket club. Yes. Um, with some very, you know, eminent people around and former heroes, actually, if you think about it. Mm. You very soon actually, you very soon realise they're as human as you are. Mm. Um, being what I am, I mean, sort of the the cheeky chappy thing, or sort of the sort of the slightly um, sarcastic humour that comes out as a sort of self defence mechanism. Mm. In the end, I had this um, relationship with my captain. So Railingworth, as I say, twenty odd years older, um, supremely well known in the game. Yeah. Ashes winner, nineteen seventy, Leicestershire captain, you know, a, an icon of the game then. Yeah. Um, we had we sort of developed a sort of avuncular stroke nephew type relationship, where we actually got on very well from very different backgrounds, very different attitudes, yeah, with a lot of mutual respect. And so you you build on that with your captain. You build on that. You know, so the younger players, it's a very different dynamic. Mm. Um, and again, the the one thing that gives you power is if you are able to perform on the field, because everyone in a team environment will look up to you more. If you're contributing and playing well, you know, if, if you're if you're struggling, I mean, the, the great thing about team environment is the support you get from those around you. But if you're um, succeeding, then again, you you get that thing from the, the added kudos and the respect you get from being good at what you're doing in that team environment. So, as you get better and more successful, you then obviously gain your confidence. And as you go down through the years, and you start to gain seniority as well as all the rest of it, then of course. Again, that changes the dynamic. Yes. And so as you became more senior and then indeed captain, did you have to learn other skills? Because then you're kind of talking about leadership skills, mm. aren't you? And how to motivate the team and things like that. So Yeah, all those things. Um, if you look at the modern era, I mean, mm. as we speak, we're sort of with an imminent Ashes series, a fellow called Ben Stokes, who if you looked at him seven or eight years ago, you'd have thought, well, he's never going to captain England. Mm. You look at him now, he has every skill, it seems, imaginable. Mm. Um, empathy, knowledge, instinct, um, attacking awareness, um, feel for the game. Um, you know, anyone who, who's played for England in the last 12 months would tell you that Ben Stokes is a really, really good captain because of all those things he's just acquired naturally. And he's acquired them, what, through experience? Yeah, think? I think, actually, interesting, he's acquired them through good and bad experience. Right. Because he's mm. been, he went through an awful lot of trauma, actually. Father, his father dying slowly, oh. um, injuries, setbacks, all of which toughen you up. Yeah. I mean, he's already a very tough nut before that. Yeah. But I think what, when, what I'm hearing from within that camp, and, of course, when you're outside of the camp, you don't get the whole, whole thing verbatim, but what I'm hearing from inside that camp is that the fact that he's been through all that mm. allows him to empathise with people's failures. Mm. In other words, 
everyone it's, it's it's the easiest job in the world when everyone's playing well you're winning games yes. and people are performing mm. always someone within that group is having a tougher time yes and if you are not getting the support from above that makes it yet tougher mm. but i think he is able to empathize with everyone so although actually the team has been very very successful for basically all that 12 months since he took over um you know the odd moment you need to show that empathy you need to show that understanding and that's the again your instincts are the key so you might have an understanding of the game of cricket you might have um you know, people within that group that you get on well with automatically mm. because they are sort of people like you and you understand them more easily mm. but the hardest part is to work out how to deal with those that aren't necessarily like you but of exactly. course yeah you know, i mean i've always had i think a, a reasonable ability to sort of bridge the gaps in um what do you want to call it you know so the, the so the different the different backgrounds you know the different ways of speaking yes you know, you know there are people in a professional cricket team you know we had people who'd come from university we had teachers we had a fellow called les taylor for instance les who came out of the mines you know he was a miner when he started and just happened to be a very good bowler so he comes out and of course he's got a very different perspective to the rest of the world he's also deaf in one ear which made it hard but i mean oh my goodness um, <laughs> You know, signalling to Les as to whether he wanted two slips or three was sometimes you know, <laughs> hand signals rather more than shouting at him. But the you know, but you work out a way to get on with everyone. Mm. And I, I don't think I had any problems with people. Very very few over the course of the you know, best part of twenty years, where someone just couldn't you just couldn't get on with them. Was it a different way of communicating in the privacy of the dressing room? Uh, yeah, dressing rooms can be weird places. Yeah, um, I mean. <laughs> Times change, of course. Yeah. And you could say things in dressing rooms you wouldn't necessarily say out in the street. Mm-hmm. Um, people understand, but it's a language that they all understand. And you, if when you first go there, you don't necessarily understand the language, you pick it up incredibly quickly. And mm-hmm. there is, you know, there is humour, there is banter, mm-hmm. there is um, empathy. You know, if if someone's just, for instance, a classic example, which happens all the time in cricket, if you get out, yes, you know, as a batsman, if you get out, if you've got 150, you're probably okay. Yeah. If it's three then it's not been a good day so far. So there's that classic thing where you come back into a dressing room and someone says, bad luck. Now, I used to have a slight problem with this because most of the time you know whether it's bad luck, a good ball, your own fault, and most of the time it's your own fault. Yeah. So already you're being self-critical. And someone just says automatically bad luck. Now, I used to sort of have to speak to people, say, look, um, when I got a bit more, a bit more senior. So yes. Said, um, tell you what, here's, here's the deal. Yeah. Um, if I get out you know, badly... Yeah. Please don't say bad luck. And you will just, well, leave it for 10 minutes. We'll have a bit of a chat and, you will, and we'll discuss it if need be. But just leave me alone because yeah. don't say bad luck because that could actually have the wrong effect. Yes. Because actually it's a very, very emotional time. Yes. You know, failure is failure. Yeah. You know, and if it happens day after day after day, of course, it gets even tougher. But you know, on the odd day, you know, the instant of failure, oh, you, know, you just want 10 minutes, maybe slightly longer to yeah. pull yourself together and just, just let it simmer down and then you can speak to people. Yeah. But just to be told bad luck, nah, it wasn't that bad. must be, you know, so, yeah. It's you know, so, my fault. I'm telling you, it's my fault. That must have been really yeah. irritating, actually, well, it's, yeah, in some yeah, ways. But it's actually but, quite a good thing. In fact, also to, to bear in mind with just colleagues and as captain, you, know, you, you need to sort of understand when to get um, angry, yeah. when to be forceful, yeah. when to be placid. Yes. Um, and I used to use, as as England captain, for instance, every now and again, I'd just shout. I'd have a bit of a rant, and it would grab people's attention. Um, and, I mean, there's one famous time for me where in, um, where was it, in India, 84-85, we had a game in Delhi, the second test match, which we had a chance of winning. Yeah. But they also had a chance of drawing. And it was drifting a bit. Yes. Um, so I had a bit of a shout. Right. And you know, galvanises people. In the privacy of the dressing room? In the dressing room. And yeah. then we go out and we actually won the game. But then people that played with me a lot realised that I might sort of let that all go. You know, so the fuse might blow. And, yes. Again, just have that have that rant, have that shout, wake them up. Yes. But actually 10 minutes later, right, here we are, we're calm, we're fine, we're getting yeah. on with the game. And, of course, it, you then st- it then starts to lose its effect because you know, they look at you thinking, well, well, give him three minutes... And we, we, then he'll have finished, <laughs> and then we just get on with the game again. You know, so you've got to be got to be quite careful. You, know, you can lose its effect, which is, I guess why things like, or people like football managers. You yes. Know, you know, eventually the, you know, the word, and it's why actually sort of cricket, cricket captains have a certain 
time that they can exist, cricket coaches, you know, football managers, whoever yes. it might be, because eventually everyone's heard everything you have to say. So you've used up every trick in your book mm. and it maybe starts to have less effect. Yes. So um, yeah, it's a natural thing to allow someone else to take over and, and use different methods. Well, it's very interesting to hear that you shouted in the privacy of the dressing room because mm. um, I, I believe you were criticised for being too um, lackadaisical or a laid-back People thought your start, your captaincy style, and and, well, yeah, and I remember you saying <laughs> that that maybe you should go and wave your arms about more on the field. Well, it's yeah, again, it's it's easy when you're winning, yeah. and no one gives a monkeys. You know, they're, yeah. they're very happy. You're winning, so you become the greatest captain that's ever lived. Yeah. You know, three months later, I mean, I went from say eighty-five Ashes win, which of course Ashes being what they are, everyone loves that yes. proudest moment of your life. You yes. know, you, you stand at the Oval with this tiny little trophy, four and a half inches high which no one can see. It's like the scene from the life of Brian, the stoning scene, where they're going, well, what is it? You know, <laughs> you know, blessed are the meek and all that. And you think, well, actually, it's the ashes. Um, but you go from that, and for instance, 86, so probably what it is, so six months later, you've been beaten again by the West Indies. And it's an abject feeling. Um, and Peter May, who was chairman of selectors, is saying, well, we'd like a bit more of this, and you know, we're not quite sure about that. And the, the, the critics are saying, well, it didn't wave his arms a lot. So... We had this great situation where I, I was given a vote of confidence of one game. So the start of the next season, you, know, you can have one game against India. So before the test match, I had some T-shirts printed. And one said, I'm in charge. You know, white T-shirt, blue lettering, I'm in charge across the chest. Mm -hmm. And the other 11 for the squad of 12. So the other 11 said, I'm not. So I got to Lord's for this test match and handed out these T-shirts to everyone. I said, right, put these on for training. Um, so it kind of tried to rebut the point that you know who was in charge of this team and of course all these things rely on success so if you take that sort of gamble um you know if, if you win that game then it was you know the most inspirational move of all time and you know it was sort of two fingers to the critics but yes. we lost so Ooh. actually at the end no at the end of that no no you're allowed to it's it's at the end of that game the captaincy was changing so it went from me to mike gatting now you know mike is a stout figure so when it got, when the news had been relayed to Mike and myself and I'd come back in the dressing room, I handed the T-shirt to him. So there was a sort of ceremonial passing of the T-shirt. So I'm in charge went to Mike. Right. Um, I could be unkind, so I could passed it to him knowing it wouldn't fit, but there we are. <laughs> yes. um, but he, as a friend, as a colleague, and in fact, as, then as a very good captain uh, thereafter, would understand that. Right. I thing is, David, you, you have got such great humour and great great wit and there are people who who I mean cricket is a is a very traditional game and some people take it very very seriously and mm. they don't actually they uh, they don't like the humour so you've got into trouble haven't you over <laughs> over sometimes well, your your use of humour well, or your um escapade it's, it can be I, I, I think I know where this is going um I mean the it, it is it is one of the great parts of the armory of any sportsman because you always know you are potentially you know, a minute away from something nasty. Yeah. As much as you love the good days and the acclaim when things are going well. So in the meantime, apart from anything else, actually, you're, I mean, in those days you're allowed to have fun being an England cricketer. Right. Um, on, you know, on, on and off the field. On, of course, success helps. Off the field, well, as long as you're being okay, successful on the field, they'll let you go slightly mad off it. Right. But yeah, we had the um, the so-called Tiger Moth incident in Australia in yes. 91 where we were playing against Queensland. There was this airstrip right next door to the ground. Um, I got out before lunch, used the opportunity in the afternoon um, to, to go and hire one of the planes. There were two of us actually, so we hired both planes. Yeah. And we did a low-level um, low level flight over the ground. Right. Which was fine. It was kind of fun. But um, what we didn't sort of really factor in particularly is one of those things was too good to miss. Hmm. Um, seventy-five dollars, by the way. You know, whole seventy-five Australian dollars, so about twenty p. Um, <laughs> yeah, for, for the half hour. Right. And at the end of the day, though, so the management hadn't really been privy to this, even though I had to borrow the money from them to pay for the flight in the first place. But I didn't R say I'm just going next door to fly a plane. It was okay. For just, um, just, it was the meal money. It was what we used to get given they as a meal allowance. So anyway, get a coke or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's free. Yeah. Um, at the end of the, <laughs> at the end of the day, the press. Asked the manager because they, you know, the, the cap was out of the bag. And they were asking management, "What about the two boys in the planes?" And the management took what is known as a dim view because they were sort of the last to know, and mm -hmm. so it never goes well. We had a 
crisis meeting the following morning. So I didn't quite come back to the hotel in time to have a crisis meeting that night. Right. Um, crisis meeting the following morning where we discussed all sorts of things, actually, including sort of discipline, motivation, mm -hmm. um, yeah, all the rest of it, professionalism. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try to sort of basically, look, I'm really sorry if I offended you but or upset you, but it was just, yeah, just a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. I saw it as a bit of harmless fun, mm -hmm. and most of the cartoons I saw relating to the incident subsequently saw it as a bit of fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an intricate story, quite a fun story. I mean, we then went down to Adelaide for the next test match. They had discussions across the airwaves. Pigeons were sent to Lords and back. <laughs> um, and it was decided that the fine, the penalty, would be a thousand pounds, which I sort of had to pay in cash because mm. that, was, that was the easiest way. Um, and then it was a question of getting into the next game and trying to, because one of the things I'd said to them is, look, sorry, it's just you know, it just had to be done, but didn't mean to cause offence, but I have been in good form. So I mean, yeah. you know, my performances on the field yes. have actually been going well. Three test matches, a lot of runs. When I walked out to bat, I and mean, the key thing, when I walked out to bat two days later. Day two of the Adelaide Test match, you know, yeah. determined to do well. Yes, um, I was only slightly distracted. The ground, the uh, man in charge of the PA system, yeah, uh, played those magnificent men in their flying machine, <laughs> which was I found amusing. Graham Gooch, who was captain, was rather glowering when I got out to join him in the field, yeah. and I then played singly the worst cricket of my life. Oh dear! Uh, for the next hour, so right. that didn't go well, mm -hmm. and you know, so it kind of lingered on. So, so just at the wrong time, actually, things were going downhill with the form. Right. And next test match, um, the final test match was at Perth, where, mm. again, unfortunately, the, sort of, the bad form continued in stark contrast to the great stuff beforehand. Mm. Um, you know, there had been good scores at Brisbane, 100 at Sydney, 100 at Melbourne. So it was great before then. Um, and I just got out and I was sort of sulking at the back of a dressing room when someone at the front of the room said, you better have a look at this. And there was this, you know, those advertising planes. Yeah that drag an enormous banner behind you know, advertising supermarkets or yes. you know, buy one, get one free deals. Well, this one had the words, and remember that Johnny Morris was the other player in the Plains mm. up, in, up in Queensland. It had the words, Gower and Morrison, sorry, Gower and Morris are innocent, mm. okay. And I thought, now I wonder who might have originated this. Now, you might have had something to do with this. I did indeed. Now, had I been... You're 80 not out and seeing yes. this flying, I'd have been absolutely delighted. Yes. As it was, management were, again, taking what's known as that slightly dim view. So I sort of looked at thinking... Oh, dear. Mm, I, I still appreciate the gesture, so I'm thank really, you for your support. I'm really sorry, because I, <laughs> I, I now realise, all these years later, that instead of doing good, it probably didn't help your cause at all. No, so so like, may I publicly like, apologise? Of course you can. Apology accepted, you're forgiven. <laughs> I have to say, it was great fun there. It was, it was. Um, you you got into trouble a few times, I think, because of your your sense of humour and and people taking well, that that you because I you you always have and still do take the game in, incredibly seriously, but there mm. but there is also humour to be had. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, you I mean, in in one's self defence, you obviously have to take it seriously to um, be motivated. To play, you need to walk out each and every day, yeah, and to get a few runs down again, you know, you need that motivation, yes, to make it work, as, yes. as well as all the all the usual things, you know, the ability, the skill, the mental capacity, the whole thing. So you need that motivation to do it, and you do take it seriously. And in fact, I mean, there are times, yeah, say times where humour works. You know, if you've had a bad day, and you can get to a stage where you and your teammates can bring a smile back on your face and yeah. say, yeah, don't worry, that's a bad day, we all do it. You know, there'll be another day where you'll, you know, you'll get out of it, that's fine. Then that humour is actually useful for, for everyone. But then, I mean, there are other times where you have to speak up. Yes. Now, for instance, on that same tour of Australia, which, um, you know, we did come second. I mean, I've had ups and downs in Ashes, come first a few times, second a few times. Yeah. Um, actually very proud of my record against Australia. But in that particular team, I mean, there was a time where because it wasn't going so well, you've got a captaincy style, which was Graham's, Graham Gucci's. Mm -hmm. You've got a management style, which was Mickey's, Mickey Stewart's, mm. which was different to mine. Mm. Um, and it kind of builds up. So you then build up something very different, which is, I said to Graham, look, I, I, there are a few things I would like to talk, talk about as a group. Yes. Because I don't feel we're quite getting this right. I mean, apart from the results, I just think the style, and you know, sort of the atmosphere in our camp is not yeah. what it could be. And you've talked, what, what always happens is you talk to, for instance, a couple of your colleagues, yes. teammates, and if they say, yes, we agree, 
So you, you always have to engineer a political situation where you've got to be sure of your support. So I remember calling this team meeting, right? in effect. So after training at Sydney one day, we sort of sat in the dressing room. And Mickey, Mickey Stewart said, well, I understand there's a few people I'd like to sort of raise a point to. David, I understand you. you know, so I've said my piece. Mm. And you look around the room for support. And you know, unfortunately, what happens sometimes, quite naturally, is people go quiet. Because oh. they're maybe not necessarily as sure of their status. Yes. Um, maybe not sure they should be speaking out publicly. Yes. Um, and so I found myself very isolated, having sort of said a few things that were critical of the way the team was being managed. And he's, he's suddenly, you know, so that sort of courage to speak has to be balanced by the timing. And what was the, what was the response there? I mean, well, did you get a good response or was it no, negative? I mean, no, I mean, it's horrible because... Oh, my goodness. What, all that happens is that... Um, because no one else speaks, because you don't have because okay, here's the difference. When I was captain, mm. I use the term loosely sometimes, you know, loosely when we're going badly, great when we're going well. Yeah. But, um, I used to encourage, wanted to encourage everyone to be able to say their piece. Right. So team meetings were not just me talking at them right. or to them. Yes. It was a discussion. It was, you know, you, know, you talked to me, you, you know, yes. everyone was, yeah. and sometimes you had to say, okay, I'm sorry, but we, you know, it is now three minutes past 12. Midnight, um, you know, we, we've got to, you know, we started at seven. No, I, I'm lying. Yeah. Um, you know, you, yeah. you need to cut it short and say, yeah. right, save the energy for the next day. But you want people to be involved. Whereas mm. Graham's style was much more, um, here's what we do. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Right. Mickey's style was much more sort of football managerish. Um, very keen, very passionate. It didn't suit everyone. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to say, Look, we need to open things up a bit. We need to do this. You know, we sort of, you know, some of this is cloying. This is actually, I found it cloying. Yes. And frustrating. Yes. <clears throat> Having spoken out, uh, I'm not quite sure about the chronology, to be honest, but Sydney mm. actually was the scene of, we had a couple of, it was one of those games we spent two and, two and a bit days fielding yes. before we got a chance to bat. Mm. We had a team talk, which I won't repeat, um, which was completely uninspiring. Oh, yeah, right. And I was livid. I remember, I remember being in here, livid to the extent that, you know, the following that night, I didn't actually. I, mean, I wasn't. I was batting, but the later in the day, and I sort of couldn't sleep because I was so livid. Mm. Uh, and the point I had to prove was, you know, we you know, was was by getting runs. So actually, it wasn't a spoken word. It was more a yes. The action, one of those few times where you use an extra motivation. Yes. To play well, and it was hugely satisfying to come out of that with a hundred and Ooh. all the rest of it. Again, we had a chance to maybe force a result in the game. Didn't quite get there, but it, you know, it, it's. It's, it's one of those things, actually, I think, where people with a certain, well, with, with the responsibility and the, you know, the ability to say, I care about this. Yes. You speak out. Yes. Um, yes. And if it is, if it doesn't fit, well, in, in your own conscience, in your own mind, you think, well, that's, I had to do that because it really was important. But you you also were, were voicing things for other people who just didn't feel they had the courage to to support that. Yes, which yeah. is such a shame. Isn't well, it, it? I mean, sometimes you you get the support, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Um, but did know, it mutinies change? Mutinies do happen, but not often. Yes. <laughs> did it change anything? Because not particularly. I mean, we sadly, actually, I suppose sadly, after that particular tour, I had a bit of a gap. So right. Um, it took me a year and a half to get back in the England team. Well, do you think it's because you had the courage to speak out? Not entirely, but I am aware that, for instance, a couple of years down the line, so I mean, got back into a team again. Yeah. And again, there was a little bit of a controversy. The I played again what turned out to be my final season of Test cricket, 92, mm. and did well against Pakistan. Mm. Um, there was a tour of India that coming winter, which I was largely told, you know, you'll be on that, don't worry. And then mm. at the last moment, they changed their minds and said no. Mm. Now, there's lots of guesswork. Mm. And mm. there are always, you know, there are always defendable theories from within management. Mm. Um, but I guess, you know, it, it, you know there's, there's possibly a link. If you, you know, if you're going to tour India for four months, you want literally everyone on side. Yes. And it was still Graham Gooch's captain, still Graham's captain. And we're, we're friends very amicable friends right now. At the time, you know, there were, there were things. Mm. Mm. And I can understand, it. you know, if he, if he wanted to look at you and I say, actually, look, that stuff a couple of years ago, you know, we can't go to India and have people, you know, battling mm. against the regime. Mm. So possibly, you know, it's human. 
possibly, but it's it's a mm. it's a it's a stretch. Mm. To be fair, I'd say it's a stretch. And did it put you off then um, speaking out in, in in the future after that? Well, I was never really in the same position to have to do it again right. in many ways. I mean, if, if you're not in the team, you can't speak in no, that environment. No, that's true. And within, um, I mean, I was then sort of concentrating on Hampshire and maybe trying to get back in again. Mm. Um, I mean, there were times at Hampshire where, um, although it was a pretty happy club and a pretty successful club, you, you know, there were things that came up where you speak as a senior player. And that was that was fine. That was that was acceptable. I mean, I did some things there I regret, actually, I have to say, but... Then you actually go into the professional speaking environment, which yes. is broadcasting yes. and writing. Yes. And in broadcasting, of course, you've got to have opinions. You've got to be able to voice them. Yes. Um, you've got to be able to criticise or... Well, criticise is sometimes too strong a word, but comment. Yes. And that can be critical on people that were colleagues 12 months ago. Yes. Um, strange. And it, yeah. it, it's strange, mm. and it does take you a little while to understand that or there's one word you need to maintain, which is honesty. Mm. If whatever you say is honest, then you can't criticise yourself. And if they get upset, it's just human nature. If, you know, if someone in an emotional atmosphere is, you know, mm. which cricket is, which sport is, mm. you know, if, they're, if someone is critical of you, you, know, you sometimes need to sit back or have a conversation face yes. to face. Yes. And I would say to people, well, have I said anything wrong? Have I been, you know, mm. have what, is what I said wrong? Mm. Mm. Or is it? You know, or can you look at yourself and say, mm. actually, it was right. Mm. And if if you can agree on that, then you can understand that you know, criticism is not necessarily critical. Yes, but uh, moving into commentating is is an entirely different skill set. And there there are many mm. sportsmen who are brilliant at the sport but couldn't commentate at all. So how did you manage to make that transition? Um, gradually, because I'd done quite a bit of commentary on both TV and radio while still technically a player. Mm. So it wasn't brand new. Um, I also had the luxury of going to Australia for a, a World Cup as a commentator, being mm. thrown into a new environment with some of the world's most famous commentators, Richie Bennett, the best of all time, pretty yes, much. You know? Yes, yes. Uh, if not the best, one of the best. People like Tony Gregg, great showman. Ian yes. Chappell, Greg Chappell, two fortified yes. Australians. Yeah. Um, and others. You know, So you're thrown into that environment and you, you have to basically survive on your wits so you just fit in as quickly as you can yes say what you have to say fight back when you know, fight your corner when you need to and actually it worked out beautifully for two months um and i went back again the following winter to be part of that channel nine broadcast in australia for a series between australia and west indies mm. and then on to india for the tour that i wasn't selected uh, as a commentator for sky so you very quickly you are um, you learn you learn the gig very quickly, and you, it's basically I, mean, I have to say it's basically down to you yes. to assimilate what's needed naturally. Wow! Because you don't have someone holding your hand saying, "Now you say that was very close," or "No, it wasn't." You know that. Now you explain that was an away swing. You you, know, you basically do it because you you understand the game, and if you find the words, because one of the I do like words. I mean, I do like yes. sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yes. But you know, there are words which fit a situation yes some that don't and you know so little things that come up so again it's having the confidence to say it but i love the humor that mm. you bring in and 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 others might be good at commentating but it's mm. it's it's not you know they don't really bring in the, the wit and it, i mean is there anything <laughs> do you get criticized for bringing the humor in because i love well, that well it's very sweet of you i mean mm. again the you can't please everyone mm. um and one of the great things about a good commentary team is having very different voices in yes. that six, seven, eight people, wherever yes. it might be. Um, now, you, from feedback that is inevitable, you, some people will like that. Mm. Others will just, ugh, you know, they, they, mm. they're not, you know, they, they don't get it mm. or their humour is different mm. or, you know, you have this sort of, the, <sighs> you know, everyone has their favourites mm. and therefore you cannot be a favourite for everyone. So for people... Um, if they do like that sort of quirky humour or the slightly mm. sort of dry humour, mm. that's fine. You know, others prefer, for instance, you know, David Lloyd, Bumble. Yeah. Absolutely super guy. Um, very, very funny. You know, the man, we, we would turn at Sky, my ears at Sky, we would turn to Bumble when things had gone quiet. Yes. You say, right, come on, you do half an hour. Right. And he'd talk to someone in the crowd, you know, when they can't hear it. I mean, they, well, they, those earpieces you get now. Yes. So if they were listening on, on, you know, if they're tuned to the Sky broadcast. Yeah. He could say, you know, you over there in the brown cap and the, you know, the ridiculous shirt. Yeah. Um, you, and if they were listening, they were, you could see oh. his face reaction. 
Oh. Yeah, you sir, that's right, you sir. And so they'd have this almost conversation. Oh, so you can't, yeah. So he would have that rapport mm. with the game, mm. with the cricketers, with the crowd, um, and just a natural humour. So I mean, someone like Bumble will always be a, a favourite for, for many. Um, and others, of course, have to be more serious about it because that's what they are. You can only be yourself. But there, there are things at, when you're in the public eye that I guess you have to be careful about what you say and how you say it. And I was very, I struck, I was struck by um, the uh, the rant that you did <laughs> at the end of last year about the state of English cricket. Is is that sort of? It's not usual to see a commentator to to speak out like that. I I was very impressed with it, and I was impressed by the passion with with which you spoke. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, that was at the end of the Ashes yeah. in Australia. So we're in Hobart's final test match, which had, and the series had, should we say, not gone well. Mm. Um, it was a thrashing. Yeah. And it wasn't just the thrashing. It was, fract I mean, just the, the, the final moments of that game in Hobart, where we'd actually been in a contest for a day and a half, and then yeah. it just all fell apart. Yeah. And it was slightly, well, it was, it was embarrassing at the end. It just right. fell apart completely. Mm -hmm. So you're... Pushed out there as a broadcaster yes. to react. Yes. And there is, I mean, normally speaking, I would say I would, I'm very happy to control the sort of sense of national pride or whatever it might be to be um, unbiased, therefore mm. to be appreciative of both teams. Yes. And that was my role as a presenter at Sky was to say, well, actually, there are two teams. You know, it wasn't just, yeah. we're not just supporting England. We are commentating on a game which involves England. And maybe Australia, India, Pakistan, whoever it might yeah, be. Absolutely. And they're allowed to play well too. So yeah. I, I was just to try and keep that balance. But as a pundit on that day, it was just it just wound it wound everyone up. I think mm. any any English from the stadium was suddenly <clears throat> yes um, felt something. And but it was one of those ones where there were all sorts of things that I mentioned. Um, yes, the influence of red ball against white ball, county cricket. Um, I mentioned IPL, which upset everyone in India because they didn't understand what I was saying because they thought I was just criticising IPL, which I wasn't. I was criticising, to be precise, the fact that various players, English players, that previous summer had been playing IPL when England were playing test matches against New Zealand in England. Mm. And it was allowed by the board because it was an extra series and you know, there was allowances made. But it just, it's one of those little things that just grated. Because to me, for instance, playing for England was the most important thing. Nowadays, we're almost on the cusp of a system where actually franchise cricket, IPL and the rest of them will take over. Mm. And the great worry is that international cricket, as we know it, will change dramatically and not for the better. Mm. So everyone who watches great test matches now, you know, we're always saying, oh, that was fantastic, great advertisement for test cricket. And, you know, please, please, please understand what this is. Yes. But this, this change, anyway, so that little rant, which is probably only a minute, yeah. minute and a half maybe, but it gets you know, social media, so it gets pushed out there. Yes. Was and, there any backlash? Um, well, uh, not really. I mean, the, a lot of people would have understood what I was saying. Yeah. So the only backlash actually was from IPL devotees who thought I was criticising IPL, which right. I wasn't. And it took probably three or four months of people catching up with this on social media where I said, look, enough. Yeah. You know, Twitter was, it was, it was getting dull because how many more times do you say, I didn't say that? Right. That's not what I said. You have misunderstood me without yes. being rude or, you know. So you, you just have to let these things, you know, the half-life mm. sorts itself out and you yes. have to sort of let these things dwindle and you know, eventually you can just get back to normal. But I don't, I mean, I, said, I, I don't look back on that regressing what I said yeah. because at the time it meant a lot to me and yes. was important to be said. Yes. Do you, are you a bit careful now with the advent of social media because everything's going to get magnified? I am very gentle with Twitter, for instance. Yeah. Um, and I don't put a lot of stuff on Instagram or. I mean, I, every now and again, you know, I sort of go to. I mean, when I've because I've a lot of the last couple of years I've been working in Pakistan, for instance, which has been great. Yeah. And so I'll put a photograph up of you know, me in Pakistan, um, you know, about to commentate on whether it be the Test matches or the PSL, whatever it might be, saying how nice it is. You know, yes. basically as a sort of it's a it's a nice thing to do. Yes. Um, but I don't. I'm not one of these people who sort of put a new photograph or a video up every other day. No. Twitter is. I just have sort of the quirky little things again, which shouldn't be offensive. Yes. Um, and if anything it starts to get nasty, I just ignore it and let it die by itself. Yes. Um, and it's it's much easier that way than trying to 
as it were, make a name for yourself on Twitter. That's not my, that's, that's, I mean, I, no. I, I could yeah. leave it, take yeah. it or leave it either way, to be honest. Yeah. And I just want to ask you about you, your stage show with Chris Cowdery. <laughs> I mean, that was a completely different, different way of speaking out. I mean, how did you uh, prepare yourself for that? Because that's quite something to do a, to do a whole performance. Well, I mean, Chris is my best mate in the game. I mean, mm. I've known him since we were 17. Yes. Um, he's such a reliable friend. And we have, you know, by dint of building up a s- small collection of after dinner, and he is a lovely, lovely speaker. You know, he's a very funny man, very dry, very witty. And we basically put together most of our best stories yeah. and would alternate in many ways. Um, and the great thing about doing a two-man show is I can then nick his lines <laughs> for when I do my own stuff. You know. <laughs> so we did about six or seven, I think, together, um, which is great fun, very nice to be with him. Um, went down pretty well, but sort of the mathematics, sort of the... In the end, I then followed up by doing a couple of tours of my own, just solo. Yeah. And it is, it's, it's, a, it's a good challenge um, because, we, you know, it's organised, it's structured. So you have basically a script or a plan. You have a sort of schedule to keep to and yeah. photographs and films. Yeah. So I would follow the, follow the script, as it were. Uh, each night, of course, is slightly different. It depends where you get a laugh or not. Yeah. And would do would do my thing, but actually, once you get into it, it becomes you know it's it's the closest I've been to acting, where you exactly, but where you for, sort of kind of remember where you're going and from that and you pain, perform it. Painfully shy boy or young man who could barely say anything at all mm. to that is a massive journey. It takes years. I mean, yeah. it's, let's face it, that yeah. was what that's forty odd years. Yeah, you know, that, you know, in between. Pretty impressive. Um, I mean, and a lot, a lot of the, it is. Well, I mean, I'm quite proud of it in, in yeah. many, many ways. But yeah. and so all of that comes from the sort of confidence you get from being good at sports. I mean, if there's a sort of moral, as it were, then if you can be good at something, it makes it easier. If you are, and I suppose to be fair, to be blunt, if you're not particularly good at anything, why, why are you going to speak in public anyway? But <laughs> 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 the sort of chicken and egg situation there. But you know, but if. <laughs> If you are, yeah, but you can be you can be good at something and maybe not so good at speaking. But you know, if you have, and one one of the lessons I learned actually from watching other people when I first started doing after dinner, and not really having much confidence in it, one of the things I learned straight away when you watch people who've done it, um, you know, more than once as it were, is if you put a smile on your face, and even just look confident, then you, you're it's already halfway there. If you're so, if 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 you if the fear is there on your face, you might have the most brilliant scripts in the world, but it's not going to work because all the all the people who are looking at you just see the fear. Exactly. So if you can share the share the smile, then you've got half a chance. And I mean, it's, again, that took me a little while just to pick that up and and go with it. That is a very good tip, and mm. and one that that I always talk about when I'm doing my my coaching that if you can look confident on the outside then everybody feels your confidence mm, mm. and that that's a that's a wonderful way for us to finish thank you so much david this has been really fabulous to talk to you and hear all these stories thank you my pleasure thanks for listening to the courage to speak presented by me leonie mellinger the courage to speak is produced by anushka warden with sound production by theo bosenket and music by Guy Pearson. For more information on The Courage to Speak, visit www.mellinger.co.uk.